Today we walk through my top five critical metalworking skills. Let's go. Critical metalworking skill number one, making accurate measurements. Peter Drucker is often quoted as saying, you can't manage what you can't measure. And even though he was talking about business, the same thing applies to metalworking. Accurate measurement is the hallmark of any good craftsman. And while just about all of us know how to use a measuring tape, when's the last time you actually put serious effort into improving your measurement game? It doesn't matter if you're a beginner or an expert. Better measurements equals better results. I've laid out here some general measuring tools. You should get familiar with all of them. I would consider these the very basics of what you need in a metalworking shop. A good set of calipers, vernier, dial, or digital, doesn't really matter, whatever you're most comfortable with. I like dial calipers because the batteries don't run out and you can read them quickly. I'm sure you've already got a measuring tape. Get a good one, it'll pay for itself over and over again. Most machinists have a six inch rule handy. This stare at one is graduated in tenths of an inch on one side. Yeah, that's metric inches, I guess. And sixty fourths of an inch on the other. This little ruler is probably the most used measuring device in my entire shop. Pick yourself up a carbide scribe and you can make a really fine mark on a piece of steel, no problem. We've also got a 12 inch steel ruler here. If I have to choose between a 12 inch and a 6 inch, I'm buying the 6 inch. This 12 inch can be handy with a little stop at the end, makes it easy to butt up against the edge of your material. And finally, some kind of protractor, so you can measure angles if you need to, I don't know how, but you could if you wanted to. It can sometimes be difficult to see exactly where your scribe lines are. That's why they make things like dicum layout fluid. In my case, a Sharpie works pretty well most times and doesn't make anywhere near the mess the dicum can. The other nice part about going with a layout fluid like this is you don't actually need a carbide scribe to mark it. You can just use the tip of your calipers without putting much force on at all. So yes, these are expensive calipers. However, with layout fluid down, all you have to do is lightly drag them across it and you'll leave a mark. Now we are clearly marked for the next operation, which takes us to work holding, critical metalworking skill number two. Now I've spent a lot of time doing my metal work on the floor, and for those of you that have done that as well, you know how important work holding is. And regardless of what the operation you're trying to perform is, Holding the workpiece steady allows you to control the location and the force you're applying to it much more easily. Just imagine where blacksmiths would have been without an anvil and a pair of tongs. Work holding comes in a million shapes and sizes. Just about every power tool has work holding of some sort built into it. But it really doesn't have to be too complicated. Essentially, all you're trying to do is add as much mass to the part you're trying to act on as you can. In this case, I'm clamping it to an 800 pound steel table. Yep, that'll do. And if it doesn't, we'll just add a bigger clamp. Now we're 801 pounds. But really, the single most important tool you can have in your shop is the bench vise. I have like 14. I may have a problem. Don't tell my wife. Thanks. And at some point you're going to want to clamp something without scratching it, so I recommend a set of soft jaws. These soft jaws here have magnets, they're made of aluminum, and they have rubber faces. But you can jam a couple pieces of wood in there, make them out of brass or copper. Hell, even the leather from an old belt will do the trick. But at some point you're going to want to clamp something without scratching it up.
And critical metalworking skill number three is drilling. I'm sure everyone's tried drilling a hole in metal, only to have their drill bit walk all over the place and leave a big squiggly line instead of a hole. In order to get a hole where you want it in metal, there's some steps you have to take first. To start, you need to measure where you want it. We covered that earlier. And once you have it marked, if you center punch it, you'll give a drill a place to rest, so it won't walk all over and ruin your piece. Then you pick your drill of poison. You could use a hand drill like this. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. I went years with just a hand drill at my disposal. Made a ton of stuff. You could get by with a hundred dollar drill and call it done. But if you want precision, repeatability, stability, and to ensure your holes are perpendicular to your workpiece, a drill press is the answer. Now that we've center punched our part, we can load it into the drill press vise and drill a hole. We talked earlier about the importance of work holding. And you can get by with a bunch of different options when you're drilling aluminum or steel. But if you're ever drilling plastic, a securely mounted vise is mandatory. The next step to ensuring the hole goes where we want it in this piece of steel is to use this, a spotting drill. It's extra rigid. You notice how short the flutes are on it. This ensures we have no deflection and that our hole starts exactly where we want it. Hey, this channel only exists thanks to your support. So if you can hit the like button and subscribe, it'd be really appreciated. Now that we're done our spot drilling operation, we can swap to a full length drill bit and drill the rest of the hole. We know now that it's gonna stay exactly where we want it. I generally use a little bit of cutting oil in this case, rapid tap. It doesn't take very much. Not for a hole this size, anyway. Steady downward pressure wins the day. You can burn up a drill bit if you don't use enough pressure or you run it too fast. Get it right and you'll get some nice big chips. And you'll progress through the metal really quickly. Operations are done, but there's one more critical element once you drill a hole. That's deburring getting rid of those sharp little edges that exist around this hole so you don't cut yourself open by accident. Or on purpose. Hmm. There's a bunch of different ways to go about deburring. In this instance, I've got a Noga deburring tool. Works really well. But if you don't have that, just grab a drill bit a few sizes larger. You can use it instead. Just like before, we're going to just touch the face, chamfer the outside of the hole, and clean it up so it's not sharp. Beauty. But my favorite method is using my hand drill with the deburring tool. It works quick, it's uniform, doesn't chatter, leaves a great result. Now that is how you drill a professional looking hole in metal. Deburred, cleaned up, where I wanted it. Let's move on. You're not gonna get very far in metal working without mastering critical skill number four, cutting. Once again, we apply our foundational skills of measuring and work holding in order to cut. A lot of people dismiss the usefulness of a hacksaw, but a hacksaw and a bench vise combined can take you a long way. Often you'll have issues with your blade wandering all over the place. There's one critical lesson for use of hand tools, and that's let the tool do the work. Yeah, I know that sounds kind of dumb. But the gist of it is, you don't need to put a whole bunch of downward pressure on a saw like this. Just move it back and forth with the weight of the saw and let it cut. If you try and muscle this through, you'll end up with a really crooked cut at the end. Another tool I recommend to go with a hacksaw is an angle grinder. These 5 inch or 4.5 inch angle grinders can be had for about 100 bucks, And they are an absolute staple tool in a workshop. And there's a million different wheels you can get that will go on these tools. Flap discs like this for smoothing metal, cleaning up edges. You can get heavier grinding discs, nice and thick for grinding metal away at a rapid rate. Even diamond saws like this for concrete, tiles, any other kind of masonry, even stone. Once again, we're going to let the tool do the work here. You can see I'm not putting a ton of downward force on this at all. I'm resting it on there, 
letting the weight of the grinder and the wheel cut through the metal. It makes it a whole lot easier to keep it straight. And once again we return to our foundational skills, grab a file, and take all the burrs and sharp edges off of this piece so that we don't cut ourselves. And besides just the obvious safety advantages, when we're fitting a couple pieces together, these burrs don't get in our way, causing issues with our fit up. Don't underestimate the mighty file. I've machined parts with just a file. Yeah, it's a lot slower than a milling machine, but you can do a lot of the same operations with just a hand file. I've made knives from scratch, just using a file and a file guide. Now files come in all shapes and sizes. Triangular, square, flat, half moon, round. For the next level of metal shaping and cutting, you get into your power tools. Your milling machines, your lathes, your sanders, your belt grinders, your saws. These all work on the same principle as files and hacksaws. You'll be better at using them once you know how to file correctly, use a hacksaw, because all the same principles apply. Things just happen way faster, that's all. Time to move to our last critical metalworking skill. Joining metal together. The basic principle is sticking piece A to piece B. Sometimes so it rotates, sometimes so it comes unfastened, sometimes so it never comes unfastened. In front of us here we have some solid rivets, some popped rivets, some clecos, some nut certs. I want to talk about clecos a little bit here because they're often underutilized. They are temporary fasteners that go into a drilled hole and hold two or more pieces of metal together. Most commonly used in race cars of the 70s and the aero industry. They're incredibly useful and not very well known. But going back to basics, sheet metal screws, self-drilling and tapping screws, nuts and bolts. You want a good collection of these on hand if you're working with metal. And from the simple bolted connection, we'll move to the next most common connection method. That is, welding. Now welding's been around since the blacksmithing days, forge welding two pieces of white hot metal together. But welding as we know it wasn't really invented till the late 1800s. You'll find two kinds of welders in most metalworking shops. On the left, a TIG welder. On the right, a MIG welder. The principle's basically the same on both. Strike an electrical arc, melt the metal, insert some filler, let it cool, and pieces are stuck together just like that. I highly recommend starting with a cheap MIG welder like this one. I think it ran maybe 300, 400 bucks, but you can get them used for half that, no problem. MIG welding is easy to learn, very forgiving, perfect really for your aspiring metal worker. After quite a few years of MIG welding, I bought myself a TIG welder. It gives me more control, more material flexibility, way more precision, but boy does it require a lot more skill. Fundamentally though, it's really all about controlling a molten puddle of metal, adding the appropriate amount of filler, letting it cool. Lots of folks will say gas welding is really the way to learn, but I disagree. I think gas welding is a little bit old fashioned, and while it's incredibly useful and versatile, MIG is a lot easier to get started on. And on that note, we're going to wrap it up here. I do my best to make videos regularly and publish them on YouTube. I would love it if you could like and subscribe. It really keeps me going. Until next time, see you later.